She comes down, cradling the baby with the umbilical cord still attached. A brand new baby, and I start crying. So once again, that video is never going to go public. <laughs> to be your host for this episode 6 of OECAST Live on the Wild Side. We're going to be interviewing Andrea Knox, the advisor on international communications and research at the Boss Foundation. Hi Andrea, how are you? Hey Nia, happy to be back here for another OECAST and chatting with you, which is always a a fun time. Uh, Viewers, or no not viewers, listeners might remember you joined us previously we talked about your role in fundraising with Boss. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm very excited to be today's host and hopefully we can discuss further about an activity that I think is not much talked about and it's equally important uh, to the orangutan rehabilitation center, uh, which is the post-release monitoring of the orangutan. So after the Boss Foundation is releasing orangutans to the wild, we don't leave them alone. But we have a special team, uh, a very dedicated team, and you were part of that team. All right, so um, before we get further into the explanation, maybe Andrea would like to explain about what is post-release monitoring, um, what do they do, how long uh, usually the activities actually goes, and um, what do you guys look for when you're doing this activity? Sure, I would love to. Um, yeah, it's my favorite thing to talk about, um, fond memories from the field uh, when I was with the team there. I was based with our post-release monitoring team at the Bukit Batikat Protection Forest. Um, we have post-release monitoring teams though at each of our release forests, um, five camps actually, and they're a really important part of the reintroduction process. Um, when most people think about orangutan reintroduction, they think about forest school, pre-release islands, and then an all ending with the big release, Hmm. which is a sort of crowning moment. But we are the team that makes sure that release was successful. The team, um, all of our teams, they live full time in the forest um, inhabited by the orangutans that we release. Um, We have three sites. I already mentioned Bukit Batika. We also have a a second release site in Central Kalimantan, uh, Tien Beber. And then we have a site in East Kalimantan as well, our KJ7 um, forest, which is actually part of an ecosystem restoration concession uh, that we lease together with our partner company, PT Roy. Um, at each location, our PRM teams, their goal is to monitor, as the name suggests, the orangutans post-release. Um, so daily what they're doing is they're going out and they're searching for orangutans they're tracking them using either radio telemetry equipment or old-fashioned methods you know looking for signs in the forest if they find them they're collecting behavioral data to see how they're adjusting to life in the forest Uh, they're also offering support in extreme circumstances so we don't give food to our orangutans after release we try to let them live by themselves but they are there for the rare emergency. If an orangutan is seriously sick or injured, they can bring in a vet to help care for that orangutan. Our PRM teams are also taking other data on the forest, um, such as phenology data. So they're looking at plants and how they're blooming. They're taking climate data, we don't rainfall, river heights, biodiversity data. Um, we also monitor orangutans in other ways, through camera traps, nest surveys, They have a lot of uh, work on their plates. (laughs) That sounds a lot, and I'm a little bit overwhelmed (laughs) when you're explaining about the activities. So it's not only orangutan behavior, but you're also looking into the plants and probably animals that exist there. Why do you do that? Why don't you just focus on the orangutans? Oh, that's because no species is an island. Um, No species lives alone. And uh, it's twofold, actually. We want to ensure these orangutans are released in healthy forests. Um, so each of our release sites was surveyed before it was selected for orangutans. We made sure it had the right habitat type, it had enough food sources. But over time, we want to continue to monitor the health of the forest, and all of these different factors are indicators of that. Furthermore, orangutans are important species to the forest. Mm-hmm. Um, They support these ecosystems, they're uh, unique seed dispersers, and them being in the forest should be supportive of this. So 
their health and the health of the forest, they're intertwined. And that's true of so many species. Um, so when we look at these forests at a, from a holistic angle, we get a better idea of what's going on there. And it also show, helps us to prove how important these forests are uh, for humans and the natural environment. Right? Orangutans are critically endangered protected species, but they're not the only important species in the forest. Um, at Batika, we have records of pangolins, which are the most trafficked animal in the world. Um, we have some bears, which are also red-listed species. They're considered vulnerable by the IUCN. We have clouded leopards. Um, we have small clawed Asian river otters. We have so many species, and these are just the iconic ones. You know, there's also tons of, you know, very important amphibian species. We have crabs in the river, which people don't realize. All eight species of hornbill found in Borneo are found there too, including the very, very rare helmeted hornbill. Um, so we need to keep track of keep track of all this so we can communicate how important these forests are and ensure they are healthy and operating in a way that uh, sustain not only their um, ecosystems, but the ecosystem services they provide to local people. Everything is intertwined and connected. So from your explanation, it sounds like the post-release monitoring is really, really important. Not only important to ensure that we release in an orangutan in an area where it has abundance of fruit and um, other vegetables and other plants that may be useful, but we also ensure that the area is well preserved. Um, is there um, a reason why uh, we the Boss Foundation especially chooses these typical areas aside from ensuring that there's food for the orangutans. Um, yeah, so it, it's not easy to pick an area. There's a lot of different factors that contribute to it. Uh, one thing that's important is that you want a habitat that can support orangutans, an ecosystem that can do so. Maybe an ecosystem that historically did have orangutans, but we do not want to pick an area that has an existing orangutan population. Uh, we are not looking to have a rehabilitant orangutans come into an area with an established population and compete with them for resources. Forests have what we call carrying capacities. So there's only a certain number of individuals that can live in one ecosystem. So we don't want to compromise already health and healthy ecosystems that have functioning populations. That's important. Um, we're also looking at the protections for these ecosystems and the relationship with local communities to these forests. We want to ensure that even if these orangutans are safe for the years where we're releasing them, they'll be safe for decades and decades afterwards. We don't want to release orangutans in a forest that's at risk for being logged in 50 years. We don't want to release orangutans in a forest where they might be hunted. Um, so if it's a forest where we're saying maybe historically there were orangutans decades ago, we need to find out why there aren't anymore and ensure that isn't a problem anymore. Uh, we are not only releasing these orangutans for their welfare. So we're not only doing it to give them a high quality of life, we're doing it to try to bolster the conservation pro um, outlook for the entire species. So the ultimate goal is to establish viable populations of orangutans. So that's actually, you mentioned a really interesting point where you look for areas where there is a, um, probably decades ago there's orangutans, there, but now there isn't anymore. And then let's say, um, despite you and the Foundation trying hard to ensure that the area that the orangutans are released are safe for humans but we cannot deny that there will be humans there in that area so before or even during your activities as the post-release monitoring team do you often um, meet with people and then if you do do you do anything like do you explain about what you're about to do and why you're doing that and there's orangutan probably in the area and uh, how do you handle or mitigate gain conflict with human. Um, so yeah, we do come across people. It varies by location. As I said, we survey these areas before they're selected as release sites. All the communities are informed to what we are doing and they have consented to the activities. Um, so they, uh, they've been educated on how these orangutans are going to behave and what impacts it'll have going forward. Um, but we still need to stay diligent. Um, I would say at Batikap, it depended on you know the month, but we come across people maybe twice a month, on a busy month, once a week, sometimes 
once a month. Uh, we always asked them what they were doing in the forest, made sure you know their activities uh, weren't going to be endangering the orangutans or other species there, um, and we want a good relationship with these communities as well. All of our technicians at the site are hired from these local communities. So wow. the people we're meeting, they typically know who you know we are. They're friends. Um, sometimes Baki Cop specifically it was at the cross section where people um, travel um, by foot to West Kalimantan. Oh my god! Because um, there's no roads in the area, so they do a long trek to West Kalimantan. So sometimes we would meet people from the other province who didn't know our activities as well, um, but they were just normally passing through. Wow! So it literally people living in the jungle, right? Like, not only you, but like people in general, like people, people. So, um, our closest village was about three hours away, and it is, you know... It's still pretty long. Yeah, it, it, but it's an established village. They have, you know, permanent structures, permanent buildings. They're getting resources from the jungle. Uh, they're using the ecosystem services there, but they're not living... Yeah, their village is surrounded by jungle, but they're not, you know, camping in the forest. There are still... And all these people are indigenous to the area. There are, what I've been told, I've never met them. Uh, very few people have. One of my technicians had indigenous tribes that still do live a very traditional way in the forest that are more nomadic. Um, it's incredibly rare that people come across them. Uh, they're, they're deeper into the mountains than we were. Um, as I said, I've spoken to one of our technicians. He said he came across where they were once. The way they, use, the way they travel through the forest, apparently leave signs of where they've been. Um, but I don't think they've ever been photographed, uh, so I can't speak too much to it, but it'd be a, amazing to come across them. Uh, but all these people I mentioned, they're indigenous, uh, they're what's known for listeners from outside of Indonesia, they're Dayak, but that's a blanket term, there's many types of Dayak tribes. Uh, the technicians I worked with, I think they were from five different Dayak tribes just in our camp. Um, they all have their own variation on a Dayak language, so it's really fascinating to learn about mm. and really unique. So you're, um, you're saying that the Boss Foundation is really uh, involving the local people because uh, you did not come from Indonesia, right? Where did you come from? <laughs> no, I'm not from Indonesia. Um, I'm a citizen of the U United States, um, but I, yeah, I live in Indonesia now. Uh, I got recruited for my expertise in primatology, oh. so most of our team at the PRM camps are hired very locally. Mm -hmm. We do occasionally bring in one or two queer primatologists, so we can marry the knowledge. Right? I don't know the forest as well as the guys, our technicians at the camp. Okay. Um, I have a little bit more training in orangutan behavior, so together we make a really strong team. In general, mm. I am more of an anomaly for Boss Foundation. We have over 400 employees. Four of them are foreign. Um, everyone else is Indonesian, and that's really important um, that we are empowering people who are on the ground. You know, this isn't a animals versus humans issue. The end goal will benefit both, um, and having foreigners involved is important in the way that we're all responsible for this, right? My purchases back in the United States, if I'm not making responsible purchases, will impact things on the ground here in Indonesia. So we all need to be aware that we live in a globalized world and take responsibility for it, but also empower people from the countries where these issues are occurring. Um, so it's a, it's a balancing act. For the uh, living in the forest part, what I'm interested in is that do you find it um, difficult to live in the forest? Because um, usually when we're talking with the people there, it's the, the biggest issue is connectivity. There's no internet there. How do you survive <laughs> on maybe like on weeks without any internet? Like, uh, do you just like literally from sun up to sun down, just staring at the forest, like looking for orangutans or other plants and other, other animals? It's not for everyone. Do not get me wrong. It gets idealized as the sort of back to nature. You can connect mm -hmm. spiritually and get back to your roots. It's not that. It is hard. Um, it just. But for some people, it's enjoyable. I'll say for me, the things that are, you know, people classically consider hard, I don't really mind. Um, the lack of internet to me was absolutely relaxing. Not having to constantly talk to people. Uh, that. 
probably I'm probably at an advantage there because I'm definitely an introverted person. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that was nice, and I could just enjoy honestly of working a ton and when I wasn't working it was yeah truly relaxing I love to read so I brought lots and lots of books um I do like to I'm not watching orangutans from sun up to sun down but I am watching other species um my favorite way to start the day was make some tea sit on the bench in front of my room and watch the trees and about twice a week we'd have um Rune langurs come through the trees and feed, and about three to four times a week we'd have long-tailed macaques. So I start my day not watching orangutans, but watching monkeys. Oh. Then watch orangutans in the middle of the day, and then maybe by the end I'll watch some birds as the hornbills come into roost at night. Uh, so I didn't miss the internet. A lot of people do. Um, people also complain, I guess, about leeches, but leeches aren't as bad as they say in the movies. But then again, we don't have the giant river leeches. These guys are small. They're more annoying. So what's the worst thing on, on the on the jungle? Worst thing? Oh, maybe mosquitoes. Mosquito bugs. <laughs> bugs in general, or just mosquitoes? Um, hmm. Oh, see, so yeah, I don't mind bugs. You know, seeing well, spiders aren't bugs, but seeing giant spiders and crazy like centipedes, which you have to be aware of because they are both venomous and poisonous. We have those species there. Um, yeah, they can be dangerous. The bugs are cool to see. They can be, I guess, annoying. Um, I've had lapu. Um, so they're super big, yeah, hairy caterpillars. And itchy is an understatement because oh. there's different species of them. And sometimes like they cause allergic reactions. So I will say one day I was monitoring an orangutan and I think one fell onto my collarbone. Mm -hmm. And at first, you know, it was a little bit irritated, and then it spread, and then I was actually having, like, I started to get hot, I was having a little trouble breathing, um, so uh, it passed after about an hour, I was actually trying, we were trying to get a hold of our motorist who was driving the boat, but he was with another team, because I was mm -hmm. potentially going to have to go back to camp for medicine, um, so that's in the way I don't like bugs, in the way that could be, I guess, dangerous, but I do love bugs too, like, it's very cool seeing them, you see, like, the giant stuff out of movies, praying mantises all the time, huge, huge bugs that I don't know what they are. Um, they're really, they're fascinating to see, just not to touch. That is a lot. And you know, you keep mentioning your room and camp. So you know, when I, as a theater girl myself, when I listen to your, your stories, I'm thinking like you're living um, on top of trees. <laughs> but I didn't know you would have a room. So can you explain and talk uh, more about the camp? I'm sure people would definitely want to know, like, where do you live? Do you actually, like, open an area and then set up camp? Or how does that work? So I think it's classified as a semi-permanent camp. It's in the way, of, if you're familiar with it, like, set up like an Indonesian longhouse, but not traditional uh -huh. sense. So it's uh -huh. the camp is set up on like a raised platform on top of a hill near a river in the formation of a T. So it's oh. all a big connected, imagine a T-shaped deck. Mm -hmm. And in it, we have on each of the three spikes of the T, there are quote unquote rooms, like not insulated rooms you think of in houses, but just wood planks that make walls. Yeah, my room, it's shared. So when we had volunteers come, they would stay with me if they were female. We have technicians in the room. One spike has our kitchen, which has a gas stove. Um, where we boil our water, cook our food, a giant wooden box that we use to lock our food up in. No refrigerator, because there's no constant electricity. Yeah, um, obviously. Our bathrooms are there too, uh, so we have two of those, um, sort of. So you still have bathrooms though. Um, yeah, so they're going to be different from what's considered a western style bathroom that I grew up with. And then your shower is a bucket of water, but honestly, it's super refreshing. Um, that was one of those things that people, yeah, can complain about, yo, how can you live without hot water? It's hot there, you don't want hot water. How hot does it get in the forest? Because you know, it's a lot of trees. Mm -hmm. So people might think, I personally think, it would not be that hot. It's not as hot as the city. Um, in Indonesia at least. Like it's, it isn't as hot as you think, but it is humid. When you're in the forest tracking orangutans during the day, yeah, it's not too bad. Our camp though is in this cleared area where the sun does beat down on it. Oh. So if you're like, we don't have days off, but if you spend a day in camp doing paperwork, you, you get sweatier sitting in camp working on a computer and during data than you do tracking an orangutan to the forest. Or at least I do. So when you take that shower at the end of the day, well, 
I, once again, don't. There's no word for it in English because it's not a shower. <laughs> it's okay. The, the hand shower, or you jump into the river. Um, it's really refreshing. You don't miss hot water whatsoever. Okay, I lied. You miss hot water once in a while if you have a super, super late night with a late orangutan and you come back and it's already cold. And then it can be a little rough. <laughs> Don't you uh, try to find an area where there's uh, not a lot of like orangutan in, in, for, the, for the camp? Well, the camp is in the middle of our release site, so there's orangutans who have range home ranges over our camp's area. Most of them yeah, do not come to camp. We don't want orangutans in camp. Um, once in a while, rarely if you have an intrusive or curious orangutan, um, because remember, these are rehabilitated orangutans. Mm -hmm. They've gone through the rehabilitation process. They were raised by surrogate mothers. We Part of checking that they're ready for release is a level of disinterest in humans, um, but it's not perfect. So we, at Bhakti Cap, we've released over 180 orangutans. Most of them do their own thing. Uh, but once in a while, you might have one who's curious. So we keep them away from the camp if we're there. Uh, but I do recall once, one snuck around the back and it climbed up the side of the wall and we caught it walking over the bathrooms and we yelled and ran away. Because um, we don't want them to be encouraged to come in contact with humans. While we're not going to hurt them, and we hope other people won't, we, you know, as we talked earlier, there are other people in the forest, and yeah. you can't blame someone too if they get approached by an orangutan. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. don't know and they're yeah. scared. True. You don't know how they're going to act. So we want these orangutans to, yeah, stay in the trees as they should. So we want to encourage that. I imagine people actually living there a lot longer. How long is your experience when you're doing param activities? Are there any like uh, a limitation that a staff has to stay there for, let's say? a month or maybe three months and then they're going to have to go back uh, switch it over, switch it out with another person and then after that uh, switch it out again with another person like how does it work so it's a little different for everyone um, you know people our staff are on year contracts but they're not there the entire year through um, they do get days off um, it's not in the traditional sense, you know, five days in, two days off, because as I said, the closest village is three hours away. Okay. So we work kind of on a month, off five days. Uh, so we maybe about once a month, but people prefer to generally stack their days, and so maybe they like to work for two months and then take 10 days off. Uh, and, that's, and that's for our staff who are from local villages. For staff like myself, who have to go back to the capital of the province, Palangaraya, mm -hmm. or our other staff who are from other parts of Indonesia, um, they come out, yeah, not every month, every couple months, and get a longer period of time off then. But it's a long journey back uh, yeah. to the city. So you, just, you can't do it all the time. So the closest village is three hours away. Mm -hmm. And then how long does it take from the village to go back to the city? <laughs> um, well, once again, it depends on the release I, site. I, th I, th I think I'm not going to like your answer. <laughs> so it also depends on the direction and how lucky you get with weather and boats and cars. On average, it's gotten a little quicker. When I started to go to our release site, it takes longer than to come back. So to go there takes three days. To come back would take two days. So it's only one night. It's quite quick. <laughs> um, okay. But it's actually quicker coming down because you're with the river. Um, you can yeah, rent your boats overnight. Really, if you were to do the travel back to back to back, it would only probably take 36 hours. But you know, some of the boats don't run overnight because it would be dangerous, understandably so. <laughs> uh, so it's a long trip. But once again, important to bring books. Um, it's entertaining. I've also had trips take longer. Once we were driving and the roads are made of dirt, and there was a lot of rain, and it got very muddy, and we couldn't get up the hill, so we got stuck in a sort of valley in the road overnight for about nine hours sleeping in the car until a car could come out and pull us with a tow rope. So that took an extra day. Sometimes you have to ford a river at one point by car. So if the river's too high, you have to wait till the river goes down. Um, yeah, so you, you just never know what's going to happen. It keeps it exciting. Okay. Well, I mean, um, you're right when you say that uh, this is not a job for everyone. So there's a lot of uncertainty I would say and there's a lot of like uh, fact 
factors behind how successful or how things are going to fold, which is really interesting because you're working with nature, right? So you're mm-hmm. trying as much as you can to let nature take its course yeah. with minimum intervention. Okay, but are there any cases where you have to intervene uh, for the, not only for the orangutans, but maybe um, where human intervention is much needed, especially for the rehabilitated orangutans. Like, mm-hmm. does that happen often? It happens. It doesn't happen frequently. Um, off the top of my head, I was there for over a year. There were three instances, and in each case, you know, it's always a tough decision to make. You want to only do it if it's really necessary. But these orangutans have gone through so much to get to this point. Um, while it's not ideal if we can do something to support them we'll do it if we are if we fear for their lives essentially um if they're very sick or injured so <laughs> it's a very long story but i'd say the one people find most interesting is we it's a sad a sad story with a happy ending to me we intervened with this orangutan named olivia she was a new mother a rehabilitated orangutan to be honest not a great mother but she was she was very new so they figure it out as they go um so yeah only a couple weeks after, uh, she had this baby. We found her one day without the baby and with injuries. Olivia is one of these orangutans who also doesn't like people very much. So I had to give a little pep talk about we need to, it's going to be tough, but we have to recapture this orangutan and make sure she's okay. Um, and we eventually, it's a long story, we, we did actually manage to catch her in a crate without using any sedatives, which wow. was very exciting. And. Then we took her to a camp where she was treated by a veterinarian, and we can never say 100%, but based off the evidence, the arrangement of the teeth and how deep it went, we think she was attacked by a clouded leopard, and her baby was, sorry, this is a sad story, probably eaten by said leopard. Oh no. And yeah, that's where it is quite a sad story, but we were able to give her treatment, and she made a full recovery and went back to the forest, and at least she survived to live another day, and she could have you know, another child, and she still has a future um, because we yeah. intervened. And, you know, unfortunately, yeah, predation happens in the forest. Uh, there's a couple records, not too many, clouded leopards specifically targeting either yeah, animals who are on the ground. We've had, it's our second clouded leopard attack, actually. Uh-huh. One, a male was attacked once when he was on the ground before I got there, and orangutans with babies. And in a way, her baby probably saved her life. Probably, yeah. Wow. Well, it was a great sacrifice, but at least... Um, we ensure and that the orangutans are okay and yeah she still have a future which is really nice mm-hmm. since I believe there's already like hundreds of orangutans right that's been released especially mm-hmm. uh, uh, in the area where you work but do you know at least how many orangutans that already have like a baby like the next generation so in total across all boss foundation release sites that we know of we have at least 22 babies born. So there's most certainly more than 22 babies. Um, As I said, yeah, we don't um, find every rank ten. Some are more wild and go further. Um, So it's very, very exciting. I consider myself incredibly, incredibly lucky that when I was working at Bhattikap, I had a lot of pregnant females. Um, So I saw a lot of babies. Honestly, it's one of like the biggest, in a way, honors of my life that I was one of the first people to ever see two of the orangutan babies born during my time there, just knowing I was the first person to see this baby. It just, it's so meaningful, it's so powerful. I can, I hate to say it, because it's happened to me a couple times now. The very first time I found a mother with a brand new baby, it is one of the top three experiences in my life, just the emotions that came with it. I was Mechlius and her baby Matahari, um, and then right before I left, um, an orangutan who we thought was sick, we thought may have lost the baby, compost. <laughs> oh, this is on video, but the video will never ever go public because <laughs> it is too embarrassing at the moment we <laughs> brought it back because we thought she was, you know, we thought she lost, she was pregnant but maybe lost the baby and we're waiting, she's in this nest and she doesn't want to come down. She comes down, cradling the baby with the umbilical cord still attached, a brand new baby, and I start crying. So once again, that video is never going to go public <laughs> if I have anything to do with it. Does the baby look, what does the baby look like? Like, can you see it? Like, when you when you saw the, the baby? Yeah, I mean, kind of like, 
human babies in a way. They're covered in hair, like a rag, you know, the red hair of Reagan's head, but they're more wrinkly with the closed eyes and little scrunched up faces. And they do have the natural instinct to cling to their mothers. Aww. So they're holding on right from the beginning. Um, and yeah, they're very tiny. Um, they just like humans, they, they cry when they're hungry. And their mothers nurse them. It's just, it's a very similar experience. Wow. Um, they have that same bond. The mothers yeah, care for them. Sometimes they're confused, as I said. They don't know how to naturally mother. It's not built into them. But that's just like how it is for us, too. That's a really precious um, experience. Yeah. Congratulations on having that. <laughs> and thank you for sharing it. And ho- hopefully everyone uh, are here are really inspired to um, care more about the uh, orangutan conservation. Maybe not only orangutan conservation, but conservation in general, but especially orangutans, because they're doing a really, really um, important work in, in the forest. Because when you find an orangutan uh, in the forest, like Andrea mentioned before, then you best believe that that forest is really, really rich and really natural and preserved, and there's abundance of uh, natural resources there which will not only benefit benefit uh, the animals there, but also us humans. From all of the amazing stories that you already um, mentioned, are there any other challenges that you find when you're working with, uh, with, the, with the people there especially? Do you have any cultural shock when you first uh, enter the work area or... Yeah. Um, do you feel that there's a, something that's different, but it's a good different, but you're kind of like, oh, okay, so this is happening. You yeah. Know? I mean, we're all very different, and the culture is very different from what I grew up in. Um, I, I never been exposed to the diet culture that was at our camps before moving there. I had been exposed to cultures other than my own, so I was, you know, didn't know what to expect, but I expected different, and in that way, I wouldn't say I had awful culture shock like other people. Um, And there are moments that are yeah, frustrating, but on the whole, it's understandable. If anything, I think the small differences ended up laughing more often than not. Um, when it comes to culture, when it comes to language especially. Because uh, even that, I learned Indonesian when I was there. But for them, yeah, even Indonesian wasn't the main language spoken there. It was these different Dayak languages. Um, but as I said, yeah, those, even those are fond memories. Um, I, Carl used to say, so the way we get to work is we take these long wood boats called potoks and you just sit on the boat and very frequently after a long boat ride, you lose feeling in your leg. So um, in English, I would say my leg's falling asleep. So we'd get to camp and it's hard to walk because I couldn't feel my leg. So I tell the guys, oh, kaki saya tidur. <laughs> Which is, yeah, you're laughing already. You know where this story is going. Yeah. <laughs> the loose transla- uh, it's a poor translation of my leg is sleeping. And they would just smile and nod at me and I'm keep totally walking. confused. Um, but they didn't like, say this. They don't know that you need help. <laughs> so this continued for like a month. And then at one point I say, you know, again, oh, kaki saya tidur lagi. And the guy just turns to me, and this is in Indonesian, but he says, Andrea, how can your leg be asleep? Legs don't sleep. And that's when I realized I translated an English idiom into Indonesian and doesn't translate. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, why didn't you guys not say anything for, to me for a month? You just <laughs> thought I was this crazy person. Like, well, we didn't want to be rude. Because that is different too. I'd be more direct for my culture and a lot of my directness is taken as rude and we understood those differences. So then I explained to them, I couldn't feel my leg. And they're like, oh, semutan. Yeah, which, some that. Yeah, so that comes from the word for lots of ants, right? Yeah, so lots of ants. ants crawling and biting on you, which if you were to say my legs covered in ants to me in English, I'd be like You would be confused. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So the idioms didn't translate back and forth. So that was a little barrier, but yeah, I it's a fond memory now. Yeah, I could yeah. So basically it's just like a little bit of a language barrier, but overall um, it's a fun experience, very precious memories and overall positive Um, oh, positive. I mean, there, there are hard days, don't get me wrong. There are days when you think about, uh, I want to quit, I can't do this anymore. I mean, that's any job though, right? If I were to say it's all rainbows and sunshine, you should call me a liar because I'm lying. It's not always easy. But more days than not, 
I did love it. I wouldn't change the experience of being there and working with the team for the world. Um, actually, one of my biggest regrets is not staying there longer. I thought, you know, it was my time to move back to a city that I was, you know, almost escaping from what my life should be, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. So I came back. Right. Okay. So, so far the stories uh, mention the, su the success of the orangutan rehabilitation and the release. It's proved by how well um, um, there's babies born already in the forest. Um, you probably picked up a lot of uh, positive points from the rehabilitation process. But uh, there has there ever a case where there is no other choice for the orangutans that you already released, they have to return back to their rehabilitation uh, center. Uh, and then do they um, return to the forest or what happened? So the answer is yes, but that is incredibly rare. I know I've mentioned a couple things are rare, but that, don't quote me on it, I know I'm being recorded, but so I think it's only happened twice ever in boss history. Once was a medical reason, and once was an intrusion reason. So the orangutan intruding on a local village, and, they, and he had to be returned. Um, in the case of that orangutan, he went back to the rehabilitation center, but was able to return to a forest later at a different release site further from human settlement. Oh. Um, so there was none of that sort of yeah, temptation, and hopefully he was able to adjust to life. Well, not hopefully, we tracked him, we know he was able to yeah, mm -hmm. adjust to life in a forest without having to yeah, raid, try to raid human crops or anything, which is not common. But so he was, yeah, there was a happy ending for him. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it's super uncommon. But as I, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, safety does come first and yeah. orangutans aren't dangerous, but we work with local villages and if they perceive an orangutan as a threat, then we take that seriously. I said, okay. that's all, us returning an orangutan for intruding on a village has only happened once ever in the history of boss. Um, so it was an extreme case. Okay. Well, good to know that um, everything eventually went well. So I think this is an opportunity for everyone to learn more about the activities of the post-release monitoring um, through the orangutan uh, or ID's website. Uh, we have stories um, yes. that you can also read, uh, not only here from Andrea, but there are so many stories uh, of success. And you can also find some of the orangutans that you hear today on the OCast on the website as well. And you can learn more about the updates if there are updates. Mm -hmm. And speaking of um, finding orangutans and able to give updates on the website, how hard is it to actually find an orangutan that you already rehabilitate? And is it easier to find rehabilitated orangutans versus the wild orangutans? Yes, but it's not easy still and it depends on the individual. So we release all of our orangutans with a radio telemetry implant mm -hmm. in their back and this sends out a signal so we have a corresponding device mm -hmm. and we can use that to track the orangutan. It's unique to each orangutan so we know who it is and if we're within 300 meters, the direction they're in. Um, that being said though, it has a limited battery life. So at this point, because we started releasing orangutans in Bhakti Cap in 2012, most of those implants are have stopped functioning. Uh, so we just have to go track them the way you track. Like manually? Yes, manually. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. You know, slowly walking through the forest, using our eyes, um, looking for signs in orangutans. Been there, you know, food scraps. You can see when they've been feeding on rat tan because they shred it. Um, you can see where they've dropped, you know, fruit skins. And we know typically the home range of a lot of the orangutans that are living in the forest. I mean, it varies by individual. So how habituated they are, if they've gone through the rehabilitation process, a lot of them, yeah, kind of ignore us and don't hide. But there's some who are very wild, who don't like humans. And orangutan, this is a great example of how smart orangutans are. Um, so like, let's say Mechlius does not like to be watched by humans. Mechlius is an orangutan. Yeah, she's an orangutan. <laughs> Sorry. <Okay. laughs> and she's smart enough to know. So even we'd have her signal. So that's how we'd find her. Because otherwise, I think without her radio signal, we would never find her because she is sneaky. Wow. So we would get her signal, know exactly which tree she was in, and you still cannot see her. 
because she's big, right? I mean, yeah. and I mean, they're large. Orange. orange. Orange blends better with the jungle than most people think because of the way when you look in the canopy. There's a lot of green, but there's a lot of leaves that are dying, and that color of orange matches the orangutans. Oh. So they do blend very well there. Um, if it was just green, actually, they might not blend as well because they'd stick out because you're used to muddled colors in the canopy. Mm -hmm. But she's smart enough to know not only to hide. But if she doesn't move, we can't see her, essentially. So she will, if you get to the tree she's in, and she will stay in the same position. She's very patient. So sometimes I get to leave. Yeah. We don't want to keep her in the same position if she refuses to move. And just not move. And Because she knows even if you can't see her, when she moves, the rest of the tree moves. And then that's how you find her. So and other orangutans have done this, too, where they know. they If they want to you know, stay hidden from a human, they don't run away and hide. They just freeze, freeze. in the position they're in. And it is incredibly difficult to find them. Um, so orangutans like that. Wow, so it's like a challenge. battle of will. Like, who's break first? Yes, but we also don't want to push that will. Oh, you know? yeah, of course. We don't want to keep her hiding in a tree for five hours instead of feeding in the forest. So yeah, if there's a fair. day she's essentially refusing to be monitored, that's it. And her, in general, she was the orangutan I mentioned. Who, that was the first orangutan I found with a brand new baby. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so when we knew she was pregnant, she was a high priority. So like once a month, we want to check on her, but not stress her out. So whether mm -hmm. right, maybe we do full day monitoring for a couple of days, her, we'd go in, see that she was healthy and good and get out because we were, her, our presence was just too stressful for her. Okay. Um, but because she was pregnant, we wanted to make sure there was no complications. Uh, so it was just, yeah, we cater it to the individual. Their welfare comes first and above all. Wow. <laughs> Um, if they allow, we love to take behavioral data, but as I said, that's secondary to welfare. Hmm. So that's why you spend so much time in the forest, because these orangutans are actually hiding and doing what orangutans are supposed to do. Okay. Yeah, I love that. I wish they all did that. I mean, it makes... The <laughs> would make research on orangutans harder, though. Yes, it, it makes PRM much more difficult. And the teams don't like it, but in terms of conservation and their protection, it's great. We don't yeah. want other people finding them. If we can't find them, others can't either. True. Um, they're safer that way. True. Okay. So, um, what are the essential tools uh, that you bring to the forest? Like, do you bring binoculars, or like, are you really just relying on your senses? And or I'm pretty sure the people there are really um, aware of their surroundings and kind of aware that oh, there's an orangutan there, but you probably couldn't really see it that well. What do you yeah. use to like do the observation? Yeah, genius. The technicians are fantastic. They're very in tune with the forest, but still, um, the forest is tricky. So we always pack a day pack. Um, you pack your data sheets. I mentioned the radio telemetry equipment, so your receiver to help track orangutans. Um, we bring GPS, which is important not only for our navigation, but if we find an orangutan, we mark the exact spot. We bring ba extra batteries and a backup compass <laughs> so you don't get lost. Um, we do bring binoculars and cameras. Um, even if you could see it, if you're recording, uh, <laughs> if you're sorry, if you're recording behavioral data, and they're far away, you can't see the details of it without, you know, aid. You're bringing waterproofs because it rains a lot in the forest. Um, you're bringing a book in case you get stuck waiting for the boat for a while. At least I bring a book. Um, your lunch, water. These are all important things, and everyone has their own pack. Also, it's important how you dress. Um, you're wearing rubber boots, long pants, long sleeves. Um, your clothes should be forest color. You don't want to stick out in the forest. We want to blend in. Um, a lot of our staff <laughs> like to wear uh, their boss clothes, of course. Um, I always say in the forest, maybe you don't want to bring clothes you really like because there's rat ten everywhere. And for those of you who are not familiar with rat ten, rat ten is covered in spikes. Oh. And your clothes will be punched up with holes. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you still like to wear a nice... Uh, Boss Foundation gear for feeling fancy, like the gear you can find in our OU shop. Yay! <laughs> um, hats as well. It's You're pretty shaded in the forest, but when you take the boat, you're very exposed. And if you have a fair complexion like myself, you are likely to get sunburned. So I have been known to sport a very stylish bucket hat, which you can also find in the OU shop. <laughs> Um, we have all of that stuff there. Oh, and I forgot a very important one, watches. You need that for behavioral observation so you know yeah, what time like it is. What time is this and how long they've been doing what they're doing, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Wow. So 
there's so many activities, so many to uncover, but unfortunately, again, due to, due to time limit, we're gonna have to end the O cast here. But again, thank you so much, Andrea, for sharing your amazing, precious experience with everyone. And um, if you really want to learn more, please head out to the Boss Foundation's YouTube. That is a Boss Foundation, as well as follow our so other social media such as Instagram, again Boss Foundation, Twitter Bornean, Bornean underscore O O U. Also follow our um, Orangutan shop merchandise where you can get your Boss Foundation gears. Website www.rangitan.org.id to read more about the PRM activities, how you can support. Uh, we have a lot of information that you can read, and that is the end of today's session. And also, you can comment on this um, post on what type of topics that you would like to hear next. See you around and stay healthy. Mm -hmm.